Okay, guys, so I am going to teach you about the respiratory system and how it works. It's a lot of science processes that kind of explain how your lungs actually work. So we're just going to run through this. Um, so first, obviously, you need to breathe. You need to get enough oxygen from your atmosphere and release the CO2 that you no longer need. Um, there's lots of ways to divide this up, but the easiest way is to divide it by like anatomical structures and functions. So you have conducting airways and you have gas exchange surfaces, which I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, obviously the primary goal is to exchange gas. You want to swap out your CO2 waste for your oxygen. Um, other goals that kind of work with the respiratory system, you can um, thermoregulate. There are endocrine processes with hormones and such, and then acid-base balance, which has to do with your pH of your blood. Um, okay, so you're conducting airways. So this is your nares all the way down to your larynx. It's kind of your, for, for your upper anyways. So you have conducting airways, you have upper airways and lower airways. So your upper airways are your nares, your larynx, which is kind of your nasal cavity area, your oral cavity area. Um, in this area, no gas exchange occurs at all. Basically, you're filtering air. So... You're going to filter air by your turbulence, and you're going to treat the air. You're kind of humidify and um, heat the air. This happens. So you have these structures, which at the bottom, there's a picture. The turbulence. Um, so you have turbinates, which are kind of like scroll-like structures inside your nasal cavity. And these have a ton of blood vessels in them. And that's kind of where the humidity and heat come from, is your blood vessels. And heat transfer, again, explained right here, basically it occurs faster when there's a bigger temperature difference. So if you have 98 and 34 degrees, if it's freezing outside and your body temperature is 98, there's going to be a bigger heat transfer versus if it's 75 out and you're 98 degrees, the heat transfer is very minimal and takes a lot longer. Um, and then you have your turbinates, which also filter the air. So your turbinates, again, I said were like scroll-like. So if you think about it like a maze and you blow air through that, all these large particles are going to hit the wall and stick because you're not going to be able to make the turns of that maze. And so this kind of filters out the large particles to help with pathogenic and non-pathogenic debris. Um, so that's kind of the main purpose. And then again, you want to do all of this while being energetically favorable because your body's main goal is to be energetically favorable. Um, so this is just a picture of your nares, and here's a picture of your um, turbinates, which again looks like kind of a weird maze inside your head. And then you have your pharynx and larynx. So basically, your pharynx and larynx are used for air and food. So you Want, it's optimized for air. Its default setting is air because you're breathing, you know, 99.9% .9 of your time. Um, so basically there's a reflex when you are eating or when you are drinking. So the goal is to avoid, obviously you don't want to aspirate food. So you have two things that kind of block this. So you have a retinoid cartilage, which is, um, they're on both sides, so your left and right, and they swing towards the um, larynx and they seal vertically. And then you have your epiglottis that comes and sits on top of that and seals it officially like a lid. And that keeps the food from going in the trachea and going towards your esophagus and sit. So again, those were your upper conducting airways. And now you have your lower conducting airways, which is your trachea, your bronchi, and your bronchioles. This is just kind of like a long tube-like structure through your body. So this is lined with a different type of epithelium. So your upper, your upper conducting airways have simple squamous, which can handle more aggressive environments like colder environments and uh, more pathogenic environments. Your ciliated pseudostratified epithelium is a little more delicate and so it's seen in the lower airways where there's it's already been a little warmed and a little humidified already so the pseudostratified ciliated epithelium are mucus secreting cells and um they have goblet cells that produce these they're kind of like a gland and this mucus obviously collects debris as you breathe in and the cilia move 
that debris towards your pharynx and larynx so that you can swallow that mucus. Um, another important structure for this is smooth muscle, which regulates the diameter of the structures. Uh, everyone kind of knows this, but your trachea has C-shaped cartilage in it, um, which is completely normal, but bronchi and bronchioles um, are a little different than that. So your bronchi have cartilage, but it's not as rigid and it allows it to collapse. And then your bronchioles don't have any cartilage at all, but so obviously can easily collapse. Um, so this does the last filtering of the air and the goal is to have the air be sterile by the time it hits your bronchioles or alveoli. So the function of the epithelium, it prevents penetration of noxious substances as well as secretes mediators and maintains relaxation of smooth muscle. Damage to your epithelium takes a long time to recover from. So a lot of viruses and things attack your epithelium and damage it and remove it. Um, and then it takes up to six weeks to come back, like to heal. And so that leaves you open and prone to getting even more infections. So diseases that are seen in your connecting airways, for humans, obviously smoking causes a lot of issue, but when studying it, secondhand smoke doesn't seem to irritate uh, the connecting areas of pets. If you have a viral disease, again, it goes for your epithelium cells and then reproduces more viruses, which can cause you to lose the entire function of your epithelium. And if you treat it, you have to understand that it's not necessarily growing back right away. And so you have to treat them and watch them to make sure that they don't get sick again from a different virus because they don't have epithelium. All right, so again, I had said that there's smooth muscle inside the connecting airways. Uh, this smooth muscle has some neurons that react to it. So they are a parasympathetic nervous system which if anybody knows, your parasympathetic nervous system is your, uh, sorry, rest and digest. That's what parasympathetic uh, hormone or your pathway does. So you have an M3 receptor, which is found on your muscle tissue, and that contracts when it's exposed to acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. So basically the nerve releases acetylcholine and the muscle takes it up with the M3 receptor and then it contracts. To kind of counteract that, you have an M2 receptor, which is found on the nerve. And basically when acetylcholine fills that um, synaptic cleft, the M2 receptor responds to the acetylcholine and is like, hey, we need to stop producing this. We don't want over stimulation of the muscle. And so it'll shut down the contractions of the muscle by soaking up some of that acetylcholine. And then, so a lot of issues with M2 receptors are seen for um, with an inflammation block. And so basically some inflammation blocks stop the M2 receptor from soaking back up that acetylcholine. And therefore there's like overstimulation and a ton of uh, bronchospasms, if you wanna call them, so smooth muscle contractions. And that's really seen in asthma in cats. So your LM2 receptor can um, can be a problem, especially with cats. These are all stimulated by your vagus nerve, which is a parasympathetic pathway. Uh, so there's other receptors which are not a part of the parasympathetic pathway that are a part of your sympathetic pathway, which are adrenergic receptors. So beta-2 receptor, again, is found on the muscle. It's the myocyte. And it responds to epinephrine, and that relaxes it. Uh, so epinephrine is your, like, fight-or-flight hormone. And so it will relax your smooth muscles to help with blood flow and oxygen for running or whatever you might be running from or fight or flight from. Um, so that is, epinephrine is not found or produced by neurons, it's produced by the adrenal gland. So that has to come from the blood and make its way to the beta-2 receptors. It's a little different than the acetylcholine.
And then you have your alpha-2 receptors on the nerve ending, which again decrease acetylcholine release because you can't have a feedback loop for a hormone that comes in the blood. It doesn't really work that way. So alpha-2 and M2 kind of do the same thing, and both of them decrease acetylcholine release, which decreases constriction of the smooth muscle. So this is just a better way to look at it. It's a little simpler to study. Um, where you can find the nerves or receptors in what they do. There's just a few images of what they kind of do and what they look like. Okay, so the, after you've made your way all the way down to your bronchioles, you have alveoli, which is your main structure of your respiratory system. This is where all the good things happen. Um, gas exchange is the main primary function of your your respiratory system. And so you have all these tiny little sacs, which are called alveoli. Um, there's like 400 million in the human species and probably roughly the same in all animal species. And these little sacs are crucial for respiratory gas exchange. So they're really thin layers. That way the oxygen can diffuse in and out of them. Uh, it doesn't require a lot of energy because it's using passive systems. CO2 and O2 diffusion are both passive systems. And you can increase the system when you are in need of it, like when you're running or periods of exercise. So what really is the structure? If you look at the image, there is the sac and the alveoli site wall, which is some kind of epithelium. And then there's a tiny bit of interstitial space. And then you have your endothelial cell, which is the layer, like the wall of the blood capillary. And that's it. That's all that the O2 and the CO2 have to pass through. And the thinner it is, the better diffusion will occur. So here's some terms that are kind of important. So tidal volume is just the amount of air moved in a single breath. So if you breathe in, that tidal volume is the amount of air in that single breath. Um, again, exhaled volume is going to be a little bit larger because of the water vapor that is added to it, the humidity that's added to it. And then um, that obviously increases volume because water's in it and it's warmer. So tidal volume is never a fixed unit because you can take a deep breath, you can take a shallow breath, or you just breathe normally. All of those will have different volumes, so you can't say that that's like a fixed unit. Your maximum voluntary capacity is literally the deepest breath your lungs will possibly let you take. And that's like a finite number. It's not going to change. Your MVC is exactly the same. It always will be. So functional residual capacity is the little bit of air that's remaining in your lungs because your pleural space has a little bit of negative pressure. And that's hopefully never going to go away. You need that little bit of plural negative pressure that keeps your lungs just a little bit expanded and there's going to be air in there. And that's what your FRC is. Um, so tidal volume is actually made up of other types of volumes. So you have your dead space volume, which is all the air in your conducting area. So anything that's not participating in gas exchange will be your dead space volume. And it's Considered roughly 60% of your tidal volume, it's never going to change um, the amount of air in your trachea, your bronchioles, and your nasal passages are always going to be the same with every breath. Um, your alveolar volume is going to change, and that's the air contained by your alveoli that will be doing gas exchange. Um, that can actually change a lot. We'll talk about that in a little bit, though. So... Other terms to know, you have minute ventilation, which is just your tidal volume times your breath rate. Um, and then you have your minute alveoli ventilation, which is alveoli volume times your respiratory rate, which basically your alveoli volume is how much gas exchange you should occur to live. You need that. It's important. It's how to survive. Um, that's what your minute alveoli ventilation is. And then you have my new dead space ventilation, which is just your dead space volume times your breath rate. To change these numbers, obviously, if you increase your respiratory rate, it's going to change all of these numbers. Um, so what actually causes the air to move into your lungs? So I kind of just mentioned this, but your pleural space has a little bit of negative pressure. Um, Ohm's law explains that the driving force 
causes something to move. And as long as the resistance is in, isn't inversely proportional, then the movement will occur. So for air, it's pressure. And so atmospheric pressure is going to be higher than the pressure inside your body. And so you have a little bit of negative pressure in your pleural cavity, which kind of keeps your lungs just a little bit in, um, inflated. But then your diaphragm, which is a dome-shaped muscle in your like thorax, it will flatten, which increases the area in which your lungs can be. And that obviously decreases pressure more because the more area you have with the less substance inside, the lower the pressure. So basically when your diaphragm flattens, pressure decreases even more so that then your air, the atmospheric air, is going to follow the pressure gradient and move to a lower pressure area. So it's going to flow into your lungs. And then basically when your diaphragm resets and recoils, the pressure increases and therefore the air is going to push out of your legs. Okay, we just talked about all of that. Um, so, there are some animals that do not use a diaphragm to breathe. They don't use that negative pressure. They use negative pressure differently. So elephants and rhinos lungs are fused to their rib cage. So to expand their lungs, they have muscles in their rib cage. Um, I didn't put this on here, but crocodiles have a muscle on their liver it, that attaches to their lungs and pulls their lungs down. And that's how they increase the area to decrease the pressure. Um, so we do have fluid in our pleural space and that is water and that is because water doesn't compress when force is applied water is just going to move to a lower water area um so basically water is like the perfect transporter of force because you're not going to be able to compress it so all it's going to do is push on to whatever you're like the opposite of what you're pushing on and so the air will compress under the pressure instead of the liquid. And so that's kind of helps with how your lungs work. Um, inhalation. So lungs expand due to the negative pressure, which I kind of just explained. Um, inhalation stops when your lungs are stretched at max and your rib cage are stretched at max. This is because your body is always going to want to be energetically favorable. So it's not going to push itself past too much so you have stress receptors, stretch receptors in your lungs that'll tell your body to be like, hey, inhalation needs to end. We are as stretched as we want to be. For exhalation, it's the opposite. There's going to be um, the recoil of the diaphragm causes increased pressure, which pushes the air out. Um, most species, exhalation is passive because your diaphragm put, flattens or relaxes and becomes a dome again. And basically that air just follows pressure gradient and leaves your body. Horses have an active exhalation. They push a little bit extra air than we do naturally. Um, this is because they actually use energy to push more air out because they want a little bit of passive inhalation because if they push more air out, they're going to have a little bit more negative pressure in their lungs than we do. And then inhalation is going to be even more passive at the beginning. So instead of basically contracting their diaphragm, they have a little bit of air come in before they contract their diaphragm. This is because they used to be a prey animal and it was an adaptation that made them just a little bit stronger than the rest of us. So respiration rate, you can't really count on horses because you're gonna watch those muscles and because exhalation requires muscles to contract for them, you can't, it'll be double what you want it to be because you're going to count the muscle contraction for inhalation and then the muscle contraction for exhalation. So it's not very accurate. I mean, you can always divide by two, but it's not ideal. So efficiency of a single breath. So basically tidal volume, and if you increase tidal volume, it should increase alveolar volume because we again said volume of the dead spaces is going to be exactly the same because your conducting air rays are only so big. There's only going to be so much air in there. So if you increase tidal volume, then you're going to increase volume of the alveolar because it's the only other part of the equation you can increase. So this just kind of basically, if you increase 
tidal volume, you can um, lower your rate, your respiration rate, to continue the same amount of alveolar volume. If you decrease it, obviously it's proportional and will decrease VA because VD is a kind of consistent number. So the takeaway for this is they're just directly proportional. You do not want VT to ever equal VD because that means no gas exchange is occurring. That means that the only air in your body is in conducting airways and is not helpful. Rapid shallow breathing is a method for thermoregulation, um, sometimes it's called panting for animals, and it increases filtration, but it increases minute dead space ventilation, meaning that VT would have to increase to continue VA to stay alive. Um, ways to increase ventilation, like minute ventilation, obviously is increased respiratory rate and increased depth of breathing. Uh, you can also increase cardiac output, but this isn't very efficient because you can only increase it so much before it doesn't matter because if there's not enough oxygen to put in the blood, there's no point in pumping blood faster. Um, so, and it obviously costs energy to pump your heart harder, so you can only do so much. So, grass exchange, once the air is in the alveoli, it's going to switch in diffuse passively. So you have a lot of O2 in your alveoli sac when you take a breath in. And that is going to diffuse through your alveolar site into the interstitial and then into your capillary wall. And then your CO2, which is high in the blood, is going to diffuse out of the blood into your alveoli sac and then obviously leave your respiratory system. So there's a few laws that kind of help explain this. Dalton's law is just explaining that the pressure of a gas is the sum of all the partial pressures. So atmospheric air is made of nitrogen and oxygen, and the rough percentage is 80 to 20. So if we use atmos atmospheric pressure as 1, that means that 0 0.2 is O2 and 0 0.8 is nitrogen. And so that's just kind of explaining that all the air that it that all the types of molecules that make up that type of air or that type of gas should always, like, the sum should be the same as the partial pressures. Like, if it's 80%, then it should be 0.8, and it should always add up correctly. If not, you're missing something. And then Henry's Law is just saying that the amount of gas dissolved in a liquid is proportional to the partial pressure of the gas. Um, oxygen is dissolved into the bloodstream and is directly proportional to the partial air of the oxygen in the alveolar sac. Um, so pulmonary diffusion path, basically O2 must travel across alveolar epithelium, all the layers I had already explained. And what happens to O2 is it actually binds to hemoglobin. Um, hemoglobin is just a type of protein inside your red blood cells. Uh, O2 is poorly soluble naturally. It takes a lot to continue to survive inside a liquid. So you need a lot of time. So obviously increased cardiac output can only do so much because it's going to become an issue. Um, so the natural levels, like the natural gradient should be O2, should be 100 millimeters per mercury and CO2 should be 40 millimeters per mercury. So how does oxygen actually get transported? Um, we don't really need to know these numbers, but solubility-wise, O2 in the plasma is only 1.5% of blood oxygen content. So basically, the dissolved, if you tested only the liquid part of blood for oxygen, you'd only get 1.5% of it. Um, the rest of it is actually bound to hemoglobin or in different forms. So here's just a little bit about hemoglobin. So hemoglobin has four can hold four molecules of oxygen, and that's because it has four heme groups and two ferrous iron groups. Um, so ferrous iron is really important for you, but you can, the onions and other foods can actually make you switch your ferrous iron to ferric iron. And ferric iron has little affinity to oxygen, so it doesn't help you carry oxygen through your blood. And so it's actually really bad for you. Um, it's considered a toxin. Cats don't have the enzyme to switch ferric iron back to ferrous iron, and so that can be a huge um, issue for them.
Most species, though, do have an enzyme that fixes it. So hemoglobin's affinity to oxygen can actually be changed quite a lot depending on things. So you've got pH, CO2 levels, O2 levels, and temperature can all affect this. Um, this is a little bit better of an explanation. So to shift the curve to the right and actually decrease affinity, you're going to lower pH, you're going to increase CO2, and you're going to increase temperature. There's also a protein called 2,3-DPG. It can also be called like 2,3-BPG. And basically, it's produced in response to chronic acidosis. So the shift in the curve to the right basically improves delivery of O2, which is what you want to your tissues to kind of fix the acidosis. And then to shift it to the left and kind of hold on to that oxygen to have your hemoglobin kind of hold on and not let go of oxygen is an increase in pH, a decrease in CO2, and a decrease in temperature. And fetal hemoglobin does this because because it's trying to pass through the placenta, it needs to hold on to that oxygen as much as possible to get it to the tissues. And so it shifts to the left. It kind of holds on to oxygen a little bit better. So the role of the blood. Uh, basically, so RBCs don't need a lot of oxygen to actually do their job. They're one of those tissues that just runs well on low oxygen. And so Basically, your oxygen O2 level should be as accurate as it is with diffusion or diffusion from your alveolar sacs. Um, so, and then tr CO2 can be transported in your blood in three forms. So there's physically dissolved, which is a little bit higher than physically dissolved oxygen. Again, physically dissolved oxygen is 1.5% and physically dissolved Carbohydrates is, or sorry, carbon dioxide is 5%. The other forms are bicarbonate and carbonic acid, and then carboaminos. So I will show you a little bit more. So carboaminos are primarily found bound to amino groups on hemoglobin. So it's kind of like a competitive inhibition. So when hemoglobin is holding on to oxygen, it blocks the area in which carboaminos would bind to. But when O2 is released to the tissues, those amine groups are reopened and CO2 can rebind as a carboamino. Um, this, because hemoglobin obviously eventually makes it back to the lungs, the CO2 can kind of hitch a ride that way. And so about 3, 33% of the exhaled air of CO2 is actually carried by red blood cells. Okay, so bicarbonate and carbonic acid, which is the main form of CO2 you'll find in your blood. Um, basically, CO2 binds with water and becomes carbonic acid, and carbonic acid can switch between bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. So you kind of rarely want carbonic acid found in your body just because it's an acid. It's not ideal. Um, so the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation kind of is why it'll switch between bicarbonate and carbonic acid. And this is just to kind of maintain pH. So your carbonic acid, so pH is controlled by hydrogen ions. So the more hydrogen ions you have, the more acidic it is. So basically based on that, the pH, your carbonic acid might switch to a bicarbonate and your bicarbonate might switch to a carbonic acid. And this kind of equilibrates. It's not something we have to really worry about. And then there is a horm uh, enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, which is what switches this back and forth, depending on pH. And this is a primary buffer for CO2 and pH, and we're going to talk about bicarbonates and carbonic acid again in a little bit. So, so basically, this just explains what CO2 has to pass through. We just talked about what oxygen has to pass through. Again, it's the same amount of tissues. Um, you got your alveoli, well, you've got your blood capillary wall, your interstitial, and then your alveoli sac into the alveoli lumen. But CO2, the difference between oxygen and CO2 is CO2 is very soluble and it wants to equilibrate as much as possible. And so it, it can have an increased cardiac output and be able to diffuse naturally. CO2 will probably equilibrate no matter what. That's like its main goal. Um,
Okay, so VQ matching. So ventilation, which we've kind of already talked about, obviously has to match perfusion because the only way to get oxygen from the air is to have blood flowing. Um, so these, you want your alveoli sac to have the same amount of ventilation as it does perfusion. Um, so this is kind of the biggest part. It's going to be a little confusing, but. So VA, again, is your alveoli ventilation. And that's across your lungs. But if you think about your lungs, for humans, gravity is going to have an effect because blood is only going to flow well, it's just going to flow better to the bottom part of your lungs just because gravity pulls on stuff, and that's just how it's going to be. For dogs and cats, it's not going to be the bottom of their lungs, but it's going to be, like, the ventral side, the side underneath them towards their belly because gravity is just going to be pulling down. So if you think about it, if we were on all fours, it would be a different part of our lungs. But so... If we think about that, so we know that the bottom of the lung, the ventral side of the lung, is going to be perfused more, but we want VQ to match, so we want ventilation to occur more, and so we're going to make the ventral part of the lung more compliant, stretch more, get more vent ventilation occurring. So the bottom of the lung has more perfusion, so it's going to have more ventilation, but we are going to make those blood vessels a little more resistant to diffusion so that all of the lung diffuses the same amount naturally. This is just another image kind of explaining the gravity thing. Um, yeah, we've just talked about that. So hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So you, again, we were talking about perfusion and how it matches. So you have these little chemoreceptors on every alveoli right before the capillary that detects your O2 level in your alveoli sac. So basically, if your alveoli sac has O2 in it, the chemoreceptor or chemosensor is like, hey, we got O2, we need blood, and it lets blood perfuse around that alveoli sac to allow diffusion. Now, if it doesn't have O2 or it's low O2, your body is going to be energetically flavorful again. It's going to be like, well, we don't need to perfuse this if there's no O2 there. So it's going to shut those capillaries off and not allow um, diffusion because there's no point. If there's no oxygen, there's no point. It's basically just a way to be energetically favorable, which is your body's main goal. So HPV extremes. So altitude has a huge uh, impact on the amount of O2 in the air. People will tell you, like, in Mount Everest, air is thinner. If you've heard, like, oh, on the top of the mountain, air is thinner, that's just talking about O2 percentages is a lot, like, low inspired oxygen. It's just, just a weird factor of altitude. So if you have low atmospheric out oxygen levels, you're going to have low alveoli oxygen levels. So basically, but if you ha if all of your lung is being, like, under uh, ventilated with O2, then your body's going to try and just shut all those capillaries off because it'll be like, there's no O2 here. We're going to be energetically favorable, favorable and cut these off. But what happens is so much capillaries are cut off that there's hypertension, like there's a lot of blood in the precapillary vessels. Um, and that can cause edema because that liquid's going to kind of leak out of the wall and kind of spread across, which then it makes it harder to breathe because all that liquid has pushed on those sacs. If this ha so, multiple organ system failure can happen um, because if your NO is like released to kind of kill off bacteria and stuff, but it's also a vasodilator and like opens up your capillaries in your vessels, and so what will happen is it will open those up, and you'll have overperfusion, which will cause a VQ mismatch, and that has a high mortality rate because it's very hard to fix. Okay, so now we've talked about VQ mismatching. We're going to go back to your airways, and we're going to talk about resistance of your airways. So, again, you've got conducting airways and um, your alveoli sacs. So you want air to flow as best as it can, so you want as low resistance as possible. And resistance is pretty much proportional to your radius of your airway, the tube. They just kind of make sense. Length doesn't really matter because it's just doesn't really impact you that much. It's definitely 
proportional to your radius. It's impacted greatly by your radius. Um, so mostly your resistance is in your nares, which is where your turbinates are, which makes sense because if you're blocking part of that radius with all these scroll-like structures and mazes, it's going to cause a little bit of resistance. Um, but you can get resistance in other areas due to like tumors and other things like that. So your upper airways, like your nares, larynx, and pharynx can be pulled open a little bit and kind of like decrease resistance and increase radius. Um, basically, that smooth, like skeleton muscle can pull on the cartilage and expand it to a slight degree and kind of impact resistance, but it doesn't really happen that much. So if you look at these images down below, it kind of explains like the pressures for natural breathing. And so if you, right now, if you exhale really hard, you can't make your nostrils close. You just can't, it's not the way it works. But if you suck in as hard as you can, your nares are gonna collapse. Um, this is because of the pressure gradient again. When you inhale that fast, your negative pressure outside the airway, um, and therefore the thoracic cavity airways will expand. Okay. So, so when you have trouble inhaling, that's your upper airways. When you have trouble exhaling, that's your intrathoracic airways. So smooth muscle contraction can close off your radius a little bit, tighten it, and make it smaller, and therefore your resistance is going to increase. This happens a lot in your bronchioli, and it can decrease compliance because if those airways uh, collapse because of the smooth muscle, then obviously they're not going to withstand airflow as well. And edema does this. So edema is fluid in your tissues. And it won't necessarily be in your airways, but what will happen is it'll be in the walls next to your airways. And that edema will cause pressure. And since it's in a rigid wall, it can only push in one direction and it's going to push towards those tubes that can collapse because that's just energetically favorable. And so it'll do that. And that will obviously ca cause the radius to shrink and the resistance to increase. Uh, tubers do the same thing. Inhalation. It can affect both. Um, doo -doo -doo. So some structural failures that are really common, nasal masses, again, we were talking about, and tracheal collapse. With nasal masses, it's hard to tell in animals because they can breathe through their mouth naturally. Like if you see a dog panting, you're not like, oh, he must be sick. So that's kind of something you need to pay attention to. And then... Soft palate displacement or for exhalation. So a lot of brachiocephalic dogs, you can like hear them. They kind of like snort and have this weird smush face. Dogs just have this weird way of breathing. And that's because of all this soft palate extra tissue they have. Um, so their larynx can collapse and cause them to sound like a freight train, but they can also have their pharynx collapse, which is kind of what people hear when they say snoring. Then there's a laryngeal para uh, paresis during inhalation um, also makes a sound, basically just makes it a little harder to breathe. So another thing is hypersensitivity. So anybody with allergies will kind of understand this. So there are a lot of things that cause smooth muscle constrictions. You got histamines, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, other zones, all these things. So basically your airways will constrict because of these things. And your lower airways have smooth muscle, which allow them to restrict in response to histamine. So your lower, you don't want your lower airways to constrict, but they naturally can. So it kind of makes it harder to breathe. Then hypersensitivity is when you're allergic to something or you have chronic inflammation. So um, sorry. So hyperreactivity is narrowing of the airways, which we said is with smooth muscle constriction. And it poses the greatest immediate threat to life because if they close off too fast, like anybody who knows, like a highly allergic person, you're always worried their airways are going to close off. This is what hyperreactivity causes. Um, 
So the problem is with this exaggerated response. So normally, a lot of these things are caused by normal things like pollen. People are allergic to pollen and animals are the same. They get allergic to stuff they don't need to uh, technically respond to. And so basically you get an exaggerated response so that their airways are getting stimulated and they close so much that it can um, cause them to be life-threatening. So basically, they lose the, air to, the ability to ventilate their alveoli. Um, some animals with like allergies that you don't notice, they'll end up using their, they'll forcefully inhale and forcefully exhale just to stay alive. And this will result in weight loss. Like they will lose weight because they're using so much energy to pull and close um, their rib cage. So lung compliance. So lung compliance is basically, it, you want the least amount of energy to be put in for your lungs to move. Like you just want your lungs to move without having to use that much energy. Um, it's almost energetically favorable. You almost get all the energy back that you put in, but you don't because of heat loss. Obviously your lungs get a little warmer when they're being worked and not being worked. So you have to stay energetically favorable. You again, you have those stretch receptors in your rib cage and your lungs. They're like, hey, we're going too far. We need you to stop, and that way they don't waste energy. So high compliance means low stress but high strain. That means that a little bit of stress will cause the tissue to change a lot. Strain is just the amount of change due to stress. So you want it to be low stress, but have a lot of compliance. You want it to move a lot with a little bit of pressure. Okay, so this is so lung compliance, which we were just talking about. To make your lungs compliant, you have some surface tension you need to over like react. And so you have pressure, the, the pressure formula, which is obviously simplified from love place, but um, P equals 2T divided by R. And so 2T, obviously, that's your surface tension, and R is your radius. But you need your radius to be really small um, of your alveoli because you want that to um, decrease your pressure. The only other thing we can decrease is tension. And how do we do that? We use this chemical called surfactant, um, which basically allows us to maintain our radius while decreasing pressure. So basically your alveoli site type two secretes surfactant, which allows your surface tension to stretch a little by breaking some hydrogen bonds. So here's a little diagram, which is kind of really cool. So it kind of explains it. So when you first breathe in, that radius is shrinking as you breathe, which means that there's you're increasing pressure. So when it shrinks too much, it'll cause more effort to put air in, which is stage two. But once you push past that part, your radius again is um, increasing, which means you need less pressure. So two, stage two is like where you don't want to be. And then it can keep blowing up and blowing up and to, then you get to stage four, which is ideal. So a sigh is a slightly deeper breath, and you every, everything, animals, humans, everybody has one about every five minutes. And basically, this is like a reset. So if we're only perfusing the t alveoli sacs that are being ventilated when we breathe, what happens to the rest of them? Because they need oxygen. You know, every tissue in your body needs oxygen. So how are your alveoli staying alive if they're not being perfused? So every five minutes you kind of reset your lungs and what happens is you sigh, which is a deep, big, deep breath, which um, ventilates all of your alveoli sacs. And that's because you have these tethers. So when you, um, if you look at stage four, when you put in enough ventilation into every alveoli sac, there's these tethers that attach them to all the other alveoli sacs and to your bronchioles and they stretch them. And that allows them to all be ventilated a little bit and because they're all being ventilated, they're all being perfused, and this kind of keeps those tissues allowed, uh, alive, and it kind of resets your lungs. Um, so how can your lung compliance be, you know, cause a problem? 
So basically, if you have pulmonary fibrosis, it causes scar tissue in your lungs. And if you have scar tissue, that means that you're stiffer, you have stiffer tissue. And so it causes more effort to expand those. So what happens is you end up shallow breathing because that's more energetically favorable, um, which reduces your tidal volume, which means you're reducing your alveoli volume because your volume dead space is going to stay the same. You can also have surfactant deficiency, which obviously if you are not reducing surface tension, then you need to really lower your radius to lower your pressure, which obviously is not ideal for breathing. Um, There's two ways that this can actually happen to you. The first one is that, again, the body always wants to be energetically favorable, so it's not going to produce something it doesn't need. So when you are a fetus, you're not producing surface factant because you're not using your lungs. You're getting all your oxygen from the placenta. So what happens is that right before they give birth, whatever animal, right before they are like 10% of gestation left, so right before they produce surfactant. But if you're born early, then you haven't produced surfactant yet, which means you you aren't reducing your surface tension. You have a ton of surface tension on your lung compliance. Um, There is this synthetic surfactant that can be produced um, and given, but that's just a main problem. And then the secondary thing is when your type two alveoli our broken alveoli sites are broken down by some kind of inflammation and that makes it so they can't um, produce surfactant. So if you look at these images, these are those tethers that I was talking to you about. Um, Emphysema actually destroys these tethers. And so then that means that there's less stretch because none of those other alveoli are pulling on any of the other ones, not stopping them. So it's not, not energetically favorable to stretch them all and it actually becomes like an effort to breathe. Okay, so since we've talked about the little chemo sensors on your alveoli that kind of say like, oh, we have O2, there's other receptors and sensors. So you've got respiratory center sensors, which are in your medulla, and then you have carotid bodies. So carotid bodies sense O2, CO2, and pH, and they are on your carotids, which if you like rub your throat, you've got your drugs, and then you've got your carotids hiding right under your jugular veins. Um, So these are small tissues on your carotid arteries, and they're usually near bifurcation, so bifurcation of your bronchioles. And they're innervated by the glazopharyngeal or the sympathetic nervous system. Basically, they're sent to your brainstem. Um, I think specifically, well, yeah, specifically your medulla of your brainstem. Um, And basically, these tell your body whether to increase your respiratory rate or decrease it or leave it the same. Um, Where they're at, because they're on your carotid artery, perfusion actually occurs really easily, which means they're really sensitive. So they give you a really precise level of what's in the blood. So the problem with this is because they are so sensitive, there are a few issues can happen. They do not, they measure your partial pressure. So they're measuring your O2, which again, we said was 1.5% of oxygen in your body. Um, So if that is lowered, then that's going to impact it, even if you have hemoglobin. But also that means that if you have low hemoglobin, like low, if you're anemic, that means you have low O2 attached to your hemoglobin. Your carotid bodies aren't responding to that. They're not seeing it. They don't know that. And so they're not increasing increasing your breathing rate because of your hemoglobin. And so that can actually impact you because if you're anemic, one of your sensors isn't triggering you to breathe more to get more oxygen. Um, Then acidosis, which is an increase in CO2 which can actually occur by holding your breath. So you can actually control your respiratory rate. If you hold your breath, your carotid bodies are gonna tell your respiratory pacemaker to increase your respiratory uh, rate. So there's other things that the carotid body can um, impact, but the carotid body uses a lot of oxygen to actually 
um, sense it to work. It needs oxygen. It's not like the RBCs that use a little bit of oxygen. These use a lot. And so they can actually impact your respiratory rate based on how much it uses. If it is using the oxygen that's in the blood near it, then it's going to sense low oxygen because it just used it. And so it's going to increase your respiratory rate. So it's a little, kind of a little too sensitive, but also helpful. So this is just kind of an image. So if you look at four, um, if a plaque, a cholesterol plaque, blocks your carotid body blood flow, then your carotid body is going to be like, oh, there's no oxygen because there's no blood flow over here. So it's always going to trigger your respiratory rate to happen. So, I mean, there are some surgeons who can remove that plaque, but it's really uh, slim. So what your best option is, is to cut that nerve and so that your carotid bodies don't impact you anymore and don't cause you to have an increased respiratory rate. Um, lots of carotid bodies, you can survive without them. You'll just be a little bit more sensitive to hypoxemia. Um, you'll also be a little more sensitive to your altitude differences, but all it's going to do is cause you to increase your respiratory rate like a little differently. It's not going to ruin you if you lose them. So that's one type of receptor that senses and controls your breathing. And then you have chemoreceptors, which are on your medulla. And they're the opposite of your carotid body. And they're sensing pH of your cerebral spinal fluid. Again, this is in your brain, so it's not going to have a blood. It's going to be, you know, inside the blood-brain barrier. So it can't test blood. But it can test your pH. And so the way it does this is it doesn't, um, it doesn't measure CO2. What it does is it once, so since water and other things can't get past your blood brain barrier, CO2, again, I told you diffuses over every barrier. It doesn't care. It'll do whatever it wants. It wants to equilibrate. So CO2 will actually pass the blood brain barrier, but once it's there, it can mix with water and become carbonic acid, which again, we've talked about. And carbonic acid likes to switch to bicarbonate and hydrogen um, ions. So that is how it impacts pH, and that is how pH is measured. Uh, I think that is all you need to know. Again, holding your breath can actually impact this, and it's pretty fast. So, so those are the sensors. You've got your respiratory pacemakers. You've got your carotid bodies, you've got your chemo sensors in the alveoli, and then you've got your central chemo sensors in your uh, chemo receptors in your medulla. So now we have some receptors in your lungs. So you've got herring brewer reflex receptors, which are basically like, hey, we've expanded and we don't want to be expanded anymore because it's not energetically favorable. And they stop. And Basically, these signals from the stretch receptors inhibit your inspir inspiration pacemaker. So basically, they're like, hey, we've stretched. We want to stop inspirating. And so what they do is they send a signal that says, hey, we're at max stretch. It stops your pacemaker. Your pacemaker then allows your lungs to recoil back to their natural shape and exhale. And then since it's no longer getting that signal from the stretch receptors, your inspiration pacemaker is going to start back up again and cause you to breathe again. It's kind of a natural flow of things. You have an unnamed reflex, which will increase your inspiration because it's not going to allow your lungs to naturally completely deflate. Um, so animals with chronic intrathoracic airway collapse or um, want to maintain tidal volume and other things, reset the herring brewer reflex to be like, hey, this is our natural stretch level. You don't have to tell the inspiration pacemaker to stop inspiring. And so it's going to breathe a little bit harder. Okay, so integrated respiratory signals. So this, here's a whole nother set of signals. Um, so no, mostly everything um, is your drive, is your CO2. Nothing's really measuring oxygen and being like, hey, this isn't right, except for your carotid bodies. So hypercapnia is increase of CO2, and that means that you have hypoventilation. So again, you want 40, level 40 for CO2, and you want level greater than 95, but between 100 and 
your brain won't react to O2 dropping below 80. That's like a natural flow of things. Altitude can change that um, low inspired O2, just natural things. We knew that, like we know 80 to 100, it's just kind of like, eh, we'll breathe a little bit harder, but we're not gonna freak out. Seven, 80 to 70 is when there's some change in your respiratory rate, where it's like, mm, we're gonna breathe deeper, we're gonna increase our respiratory rate. 70, 60, your body is like, hey, we need to pick it up. We are not doing something right. So then you have another drive, which is in your diaphragm, your intercostals, and your abdomen or abdominals, which are just muscles that are your last ones. So they're kind of like, hey, we're breathing, we're here, we're flexing and stuff. Botulism actually prevents the movement of skeletal muscles, so it stops all those muscles, which makes it even harder to breathe. Okay. So if that was all the control of breathing, then we have um, the secondary functions. So again, we had talked about the main function is ga uh, gas exchange, but there's thermoregulation, humidification, filtration, and then obviously you have an immune function because you have mucus that's kind of helping all that stuff. So I talked about tur turbinates and how they kind of humidify and um, filter the air, but this is just kind of a little bit of an in-depth version of it. So it's a passive, passive process because you have all these blood vessels in your turbinates inside your nasal cavity that are kind of helping heat and stuff diffuse across into the air. But it's important to note that 100% humidity changes depending on the change, like temperature. So your body can be working really hard to humidify, but if you're breathing in really cold air, it's just not, it's going to try. It's going to try as best it can, but it's not going to be great. What, your bronchi should have air that's fully conditioned. Um, when you are doing exercise, though, that might not be true because you're pulling air in and pulling air in faster than you normally would, and so that air might not have had time to um, be heated and humidified as fast as normal. So dry air. So if you haven't actually humidified the air that much, dry air can cause bronchospasms because of bronchoconstriction. This is really common in those hypersensitive people, like people with asthma or animals with asthma. Um, thermal regulation. So we kind of talked about this, but you can get rid of heat. Dogs pant um, just from breathing out of your mouth. And then people who run, they're breathing out of their mouth to help with that heat. And that's in your conducting airways. So, mucociliary apparatus. So, how do we actually have an immune benefit in our conducting airways? So, we have, again, I talked about the cilia. You have pseudo stratified ciliated epithelium in your up, uh, lower airways. And basically, they have, there's two layers of your mucus. You've got aqueous layer and mucus layer, and those kind of mixed together to help it move a little bit better because, again, people will think of mucus as being pretty sticky. Um, and the goal is to move all that stuff towards your pharynx and larynx. You don't want that to hit your uh, bronchioles and your alveoli sacs. So you're going to push that as high up as you can. So you can increase your mucillary transport system with beta adrenergic agonists. Um, basically it just stimulates your smooth muscle to relax, making the airways wider, allowing your mucus to move faster. You can measure this by using an endoscope and marking it where the droplet is and then coming back a few minutes later and figuring it out and marking again and checking the distance. Um, every species has like a normal speed. And if you compare that speed to this, what, what you've measured, you can kind of determine if the animal is likely to get sick more often, if their mucociliary transport is lower than normal. Um, viruses and, and irritants can cause this. Um, so you can overstimulate your mucus production, which a lot of people know, like you get like snotty and like uh, coughing a lot when you are sick. So the M3 receptor has to do with your mucus production. So if you um, treat that and block it, then you'll produce less. 
it's, it'll actually move slower. So I just talked about coughing a little bit, but coughing is a forced exhalation, which causes a lot of air through your airways as fast as possible. And it kind of shreds that mucus off and it helps move that mucus faster to the front. So the way it works is you breathe in and your larynx closes. So you have that air trapped in your um, alveoli sacs in your airway. And when your diaphragm relaxes and that pressure is being pushed, you have an even higher pressure in your airways. So then your larynx opens in that you have higher pressure than you do in the atmosphere and all that air is going to try and rush out of you. And that, that rush tries to pull all that mucus out and that's kind of what a cough is. I think everything on here, we just kind of explain. So if that's what's happening, or um, if you produce too much mucus, or it's not being cleared efficiently because you're just not coughing a lot, then you have therapeutic um, targets is to target your production, which again, we said M3 receptors will slow this secretion. And then you want to work on clearing that mucus that's there. Um, for coughing, I thought I had it on here, but maybe I don't. Um, you only have receptors or like irritants can only be happening in your lower airways that cause you to cough. You don't really have that in your um, bronchioles or in your upper airways. Oh, here we go. In the large airways. There we go. So if you look at D, that's kind of just a diagram that shows the pressure numbers to help you kind of understand how it works. Um, so we said that there are only receptors or irritants are only responding in the larger airways. That kind of makes sense. But that doesn't mean that your bronchioles aren't infected. It just means that they don't have the receptors to tell you that they are infected. And then there's a lot of nerves that are involved in coughing. Your phrenic nerve, your vagal nerve. Um, you need to be able to innervate your larynx and innervate your abdomen wall to for force exhale. So that's one way of immune defense which is mucus secretion. And the other one, you've got molecular defenses, which, so antibodies, you've got five different types of antibodies, IgA and IgG. IgG is found all across the body. IgA is specifically for like respiratory and digestive tracts and mucus layers. Basically, these find pathogens and stick an opsonin on them and are like, hey, this is a bad thing and we need it to get out of our system. Um, and then obviously some kind of immune leukocyte or something is going to come and take care of that. So your surfactant can opsonize bacteria as well, and it can activate neutrophils, which could come and take care of all those opsonized pathogens, which obviously you don't want your surfactant to become deficient because if it's one way of helping you, you want to keep it. So the idea is that the air that hits your alveoli has been filtered enough that it should be sterile it not necessarily is because when you're sick, stuff gets down there, it just happens. Um, there's a code for the opsonin proteins, which actually mutates a lot and can cause like failed marking of pathogens. And so you're more likely to get sick more and more. And that's really common in beet cattle. So other types of defense, you've got your alveoli macrophages, which obviously are phagocytic cells. They just eat whatever's bad and present it to your lymphocytes. Um, those I know it says alveoli. That's how they get in because the capillaries around your alveoli are th like thin enough that they flow in and that's how, but they're all over your respiratory tract. Then you have bronchial epithelial cells, which can um, recruit granulocytes and they produce NO, which we have said is a smooth muscle dilator and it allows the blood vessels to open up a little bit and allow bigger cells to flow through, which will allow more immunocytes to move it. And then you kind of have lymphatic tissue all over, but BALT, do you have a specific one called BALT, which is bronchus associated lymphoid tissue in your bronchus around your bifurcation, which is where those large particles will get stuck. And it recognizes those and gets rid of them. So if any of these fail, then obviously you're more likely to get sick. And so you don't want any of them to fail, but it's usually a combination of failures that is what makes you sick. Um, you're not really going to get sick from 
just one failing, but the goal is to remedy all of it and not just allow one um, to slide by. So next issues for the respiratory tract, you've got hypoxemia and there are five causes and everyone should know this, it's just reasons for life. Again, we talked about altitude. So low inspired O2 will cause you to be hypos hypoxemic. Then you have right to left shunting, which is just means that blood flow isn't making it to your lungs. If your lungs are not getting blood flow, then there's going to be low O2 because that O2 can't make it. Your lungs will be full of oxygen, but it's not being diffused into your blood for other tissues to use. So you'll be hypoxemic. Um, hypoventilation, which is also hypercapnia. Uh, basically, you have high CO2 and you're not ventilating your lungs as, or your alveoli as much as you should be. Um, there's other causes, uh, botulism, which is neuromuscular disease, deep anesthesia. You're just like slowing your muscles. You're not breathing as fast as you should be to release the CO2. That's not necessarily a disease of the lungs that can occur. There are other reasons. It can be a disease. It's not necessarily always a disease. And then diffusion impairment is just that that O2 is so, sol is so poorly soluble that it can't actually diffuse into the blood. And this is most common because it's always paired with something else. Like any of the other causes can cause this. Um, increasing your cardiac output is the, like the biggest reason there would be partly diffusion because the blood is moving so fast, it's harder for the O2 to like spread into a decent percentage of the blood. And your fifth reason, which is the most common, is VQ mismatching, which we've talked about. We've already talked about a few causes of this. But obviously, you'd be hypoxemic if you're ventilating without perfusing or if you're perfusing but not ventilating. Um, so again, leukotrienes, amines, histamines, serotonin, NO can all affect this. So if you look at this image, there's like numbers. So one is perfect. The one is that there's ventilation and perfusion all happening at the rate that you want it to. Two, if you look at it, there's very poor, or there's actually no ventilation whatsoever. Or sorry, no, no perfusion whatsoever. The yellow um, airways are, or the yellow tubes are airways. Um, so if there's no perfusion, then you're gonna be hypoxic because all that oxygen just go in and out of your lungs and not go anywhere. Um, three, if you look at it, it's just like a thicker barrier. And so that oxygen can't diffuse over, which would be your diffusion impairment. It's just not making it over. And therefore you have like under perfusion, even though your ventilating is normal. And then four, your perfusion is there. You've got your blood moving, but for whatever reason, you're not ventilating. There's something wrong, something blocking it. And so that's a type of hypoxemia. So your goals of your respiratory system are to use minimal energy to absorb O2 and to remove CO2. So you can have respiratory failure though, where these things aren't occurring. Um, endogenous sensors, obviously we talked about our carotid bodies and our res respiratory centers. And those, can, since we're testing pH of your CSF and we're testing your O2 levels, those can be affected by other things. So it's not necessarily your respiratory tract that's failing. Um, so that's kind of why they're a little inaccurate, but they're also very helpful. Um, so how do you measure that? How do we know that our respiratory failure, there's something wrong with our respiratory system? So the best way to test it is your arterial blood gas analysis. That can be done by your machine, but basically you get your blood and you don't want any air in that syringe. You want an anaerobic process. You want to test the amount of oxygen in that blood and you don't want any um, mess ups. So what you measure is your pH, your O2 level, and your CO2 level. We've already talked about this, but your O2 should be 100 millimeters per mercury, and you want your CO2 to be 40 millimeters per mercury. And your pH, a natural blood pH is 7.4. Um, so basically hypercapnia, which is related to respiratory failure, can be caused by, hypo or well, is caused by hypoventilation, but always represents hypoxemia because if you have high CO2, then you have low ventilation, which means you have low oxygen levels. So this is just a little bit explanation of the alveoli air. So at natural altitude, which is 760, which is important to know, the oxygen in the air is 152 millimeters per 
mercury. Now, if you change that altitude, you're going to get less oxygen, which we've talked about. And you can't really measure alveoli air because it you will not without cutting open the lung. That's just a test you don't want to do. And so they come up with an equation that kind of works for this, um, which is called the alveoli air equation. And it compares your CO2, your O2, your barometric pressure, and everything that might matter. So basically, you get your sample and you test it. And obviously, you want it to be anaerobic. We've talked about this. And basically, you're testing the O2 level and you're going to calculate your ideal OT, O2 O2 level using a formula, and you're going to compare the two. And if there's a larger difference than five, that means there's lung disease because it's almost like percent error. I'm sure everyone who's taken a science class has done percent error. So basically, if your percent error is off by more than 5%, you know you did something wrong. That's what this is. If you're off by more than five, then you're, something's wrong because um, you're testing your actual with your um, – you're actual with your exact, what you wanted, what you wanted to occur. So this is the blood, gla blood gas analysis. So these are kind of things that you need to know. You need your, what you're going to test for is your O2, your CO2, your pH, and your HCO3. Um, well, HCO3 is going to be calculated, but you're going to test all those things. And then you have recorded values. You're going to test your barometric pressure, you're going to write that down, hemoglobin saturation, you're going to write the percentage down, and then temperature matters, it can play a factor, so you're going to want to know that. Um, arterial sample can reflect the respiratory tract, but your venous sample can't because it's already diffused to your tissues, and so your goal is to use a arterial sample and test it, but you should know not all cases of hypoxemia are due to respiratory tract release. Obviously, we just talked about the five reasons altitude and hyperventilation, and then right to left shunting. And right to, left, right to left shunting is valve issues and vessel issues that don't usually pass a certain age. Like you don't usually tend to live past that. So those can be kind of crossed out easily. If you're not in a high altitude, then you know it's not an altitude issue. And if your patient is has a normal respiratory rate, you know they're not hyperventilating. So there's probably something wrong. And so those can kind of be eliminated without doing the formula. But this is the formula, and basically you don't want your difference to be five. This kind of explains how to do it. And then you can also use your blood glass analysis to do acid-base status um, because respiratory failure can lead to acidosis in your pH levels because we've talked about it. It impacts your pH very fast. Um, so these are your normals. So your venous pH is a little bit lower than your arterial pH. And then alkalosis in acidosis. So alkalosis is when you're higher than 7.4 and acidosis is when you're lower than 7.4. Um, and that's just comparing HCO3 with CO2. So this chart shows you all the normal values, what you're looking at for when you do that equation that was on this page, this page right here. These are normal values. These are things that you need to know. 95, we said O2 should be 95 to 100. Uh, CO2 is 40. Temperature is ideal. CO3 should be around, uh, HCO3 should be around 24, and then pH should be around 7.4. So if you have your arterial sample and you've got all these fun, your normal standards at the top, 20%, 47, 0.8. And then this is the cases. So you've got your barometric pressure. 752 is just a little bit low normal altitude. The normal altitude is 760. PA is 80. We wanted it to be 95, so it's a little low. CO2 is a little high. It's supposed to be 40. That's about normal. That's what you would expect. Two, we've got a pretty low altitude. 80, or well, sorry, pretty high altitude because you have low barometric pressure. So O2 is a little low and CO2 is normal, and that just means it's altitude problem. You're not inspiring as much O2 as you want to do. Three, You've got a pretty high barometric pressure, so your altitude is pretty low. Uh, O2 is super low. It should be at 100 to 95, and it's at 40. That's rough. And then CO2 is high. That's 78, so you definitely have a hyperventilation problem because you're hypercapnia.
So there's probably gas exchange might be fine. It might be. There might be a muscle disorder, which this case was from Bob, botulism Bob, and botulism is a disorder that stops skeletal muscle um, contraction. So basically this animal couldn't contract its diaphragm or abdomen muscles to breathe, and so it was becoming, it was hypoventilating. It was using energy to have to breathe. Um, four, that's about a normal barometric pressure. O2 is normal. CO2 is a little low. So if you do have the math, you become hyperventilating. There's more minute alveoli ventilation than CO2 being released. Uh, and so at the bottom, HCO3 should be at 24 and CO2 should be at 40. So the first case, CO2, it's roughly normal. pH is a little low and this is way low. And that means it's metabolic acidosis. Uh, 40 is normal, pH is a little high. CO2 or HCO3 is high, which means metabolic alkalosis. CO2 is high, pH is low, HCO3 is also low. So you've got respiratory acidosis and metabolic acidosis, which again happens with botulism. Botulism Bob had a rough, rough day. And then the last one is where so you got CO2 is a little lower than normal, pH is um, high or sorry, low, and HCO3 is high or low. So you got metabolic acidosis, but you've got um, alkalosis. So these are other ways to calculate VQ mismatching. So you've got physiological shunt fraction. Physiological shunt, we were just talking about this. This is like your blood being perfused versus um, what should be perfused. So your conducting airways are not perfused. There's no gas exchange happening. Well, they are being perfused for blood reasons, but they're not, there's no gas exchange happening. So 2% of the blood coming off of your lungs should not have oxygen in it because that's coming from your conducting airways. So it's not going to have oxygen because there's no gas exchange. That's 2%. If that 2% is higher, that means that some of your alveoli that were perfused were not getting oxygen, which means they were not ventilated. Um, and this is a mis VQ mismatching, so you don't want that to happen. Um, so that's one way that you can have issues. Um, physiological dead space fraction, which is measuring ventilation. Basically, your dead space, again, should be 60% of your CO2. So if you measured your breath, the first 60% of your exhale should not have any CO2 in it. And then the last 40% should have the CO2 that matches the veins coming off your lungs. Makes sense, right? If that isn't matching and you're ventilating more alveoli than you're perfusing, which should be more CO2, so you're 40%, it might be higher, and that will mess it up. So that's super hard to measure because you have to measure the entire exhale and match it to your blood. It doesn't really happen. So bore dead space fraction is actually measured, and this is your arterial with your end tidal CO2. Um, so that's your whole breath CO2 matches your arterial CO2, which again, we know our serial, arterial CO2 is 40. We want it to be 40. Now, when you breathe out, um, actually during slow, deep breathing, alveoli air should be able to equilibrate with your blood to get 40. That's what we want. Um, if you are fast respiratory, then your turbulent airflow, which means your conducting airway air and your alveoli air are mixing. And so you're going to get like a lower amount of CO2 than you should have gotten, which causes mismatching. So if you breathe faster, there's less time for air to equilibrate and therefore your fraction is going, that means your CO2 is going to be lower so your fraction goes up. Um, this is a better way to look at it because that's really confusing. So your physiological shunt fraction, you're comparing 2% of your blood should not have been gas, um, should not have had gas exchange because that's your conducting airways. If your number, if your percentage is higher than that, that means that you have VQ mismatching, which means perfusion was occurring to non-ventilated um, alveoli. Physiological dead space fraction, we said 60% of your breath should be dead space, which means there's no CO2 because there's no gas exchange. 
So the last 40% of CO2 levels should match the CO2 levels of your veins. If those don't match, then you have overventilation and underperfusion, which means that some of your ventilated alveoli were not getting blood flow, which means that O2 and CO2 were not being diffused in them. Um, a better way to look at that is bore dead space fraction. Arterial CO2 should meet match venous CO2 levels. The bigger the difference, the more worried we should be. Physical CO2 level is less than 40. Alveoli were not perfused or ventilated. And that is it for the respiratory system. So that kind of explains how your respiratory system and how you breathe. I hope that uh, was informative and some of you learned something today. Bye.